So thanks, guys. We'll get it, get it going. So yeah, OK, I'm known as the integrator. And we all have these superpowers. You guys have them, too. Uh, integration is one of our, is our brand. Integration across disciplines is the way things get done. We build teams around a problem and not, and not have a problem owned by a person. And you're going to see that as we talk through uh, a lot of the work we do today. When we integrate, one of our biggest issues that we're focusing on is this thing that's happening outside right now. Anybody notice? Somebody told me they got bit by a mosquito this morning. Half the country can't buy insurance anymore. Climate change, the causes of it, we, this is a front and center in some of the things. And how do we go and address that? We integrate across disciplines. We get the best and the brightest to work in one place together. So what we're doing is we're delivering these integrated research solutions to try to create that economy of the future that your students are going to help create. And that, I hope, is, is motivating. So empathy in the research process. You know, what, what Empathy, research, a lot of times we think about, OK, it's the scientific method. It's nice and cold. First I must question. Then I do some research. Then I create a hypothesis. Then I run experiments, et cetera, et cetera. Some people call that wash, rinse, repeat. And a lot of people are like, well, what does that, what in the world does empathy have to do with research? It's just go do research. In fact, when I was in high school, some of the, I had no idea what research was about. I would say, what is research? Well, you have to come up with questions. I'm not doing that. So how do you learn to get there? So empathy, if we think about it, it's a, a way to listen in a committed way. It's uh, understanding somebody, understanding perspectives, sharing, imagining what's possible. These are kind of the things you think about when you think about empathy. How do you build? How do you celebrate? Well, if we start turning to research, it's the same conversation. If we aren't listening, we're missing something. One of our core values at NRI is collaboration, which means we listen to everybody, because everybody has a piece of the truth as we frame a, frame a problem. We listen by committing to the listening, not by pre-judging what we're hearing, but by understanding what they're saying and understanding the perspective. Now, I'm not just talking about people. I'm talking about impacts in the environment. We've got two people here that pay attention to the critters, the water quality, the air quality. That is part of that listening. Sharing. If we aren't sharing and bringing people into the conversation, we're not doing our job as researchers. Imagine what could happen. What can we do with the information we have if we put it together in a novel way to solve a problem? Build on that? Eric might have a good idea. Leah can make it better. Of course. <laughs> but, but this is where empathy and research come together. And finally, celebrate. Now, I'm going to say something really crazy here, because in a research fashion, you have to celebrate success and failure. Because if you're not failing, you're not trying hard enough. We're not pushing the envelope hard enough. So that celebration is a big part of empathy, because if you're not running that whole circle, you're not going to be doing the research you need to be doing. So I wanted to share that with that. Uh, uh, when Patty said, we need you to talk about empathy, it's like, whoa, OK. It's not something I do every day, but it's really fundamental to, to doing good research. Because if you're not framing the research by using this, that's why we have two of these and one of these. Right? So leaving that for there. So when we look at empathy and research, it's really about ethical engagement, framing, and delivery. Framing means defining what we're going to try to do together. So that feeds into NRI and our impact. I'm not going to read all this to you, but the, the, those first four words are really where we hang our hat. Deliver. We have to deliver in the time frame that's necessary. So integrated research is building the team around the problem and driving for a solution, not an answer. We need things that are much more comprehensive than a, than a mere answer. We've got huge problems to solve. And you're going to see fast as, it, as my colleagues talk today. This is the way we organize. I don't want you to look at that, but you're going to see this symbol in, in, a, in a following slide. 
the way we're organized is we're about doing research. We've got three sites in the state, about 140 researchers. We are part of the University of Minnesota research enterprise that, that stretches across the state. So what is research? Getting into that, that conversation, it starts with framing the problem by listening, planning, what are, what are you going to do about it? Doing the ex executing the research, evaluating and coming back. Most research goes into a do loop here because we're thinking about what that impact could be. We're thinking about what's that life cycle assessment. Just because Eric might have a solution, Leah might find out that that's doing something to the water or we're seeing impacts on wildlife. We got to be thinking about all of that. Eventually we like to deliver. We bring a lot of our expertise into the game plan. There's our organization, our expertise, relationships. NRI has relationships with over 400 different companies across the world now, in addition to uh, institutions and agencies. Market voice, we pay attention to that because you might want to hear about green steel. You willing to pay for it? Don't know yet. So we have to be paying attention to these things. Facilities and that idea of life cycle thinking, what's the impact, but where do we put the team together? We put the team together there. Not up here, here. So we understand we're going after, we put the right people on the job and put it together. And that's really the empathy and research, listening, preparing, and executing. So these are our three areas we play in, and this is important because we could talk about 240 projects we run in any one day today, but we really play in this three ring circus, if you will. We start and end our conversations in ecosystem resilience, understand the world we live in, our impacts, how to manage them. Pretty simple. Future forest industries, our forests are changing, they're moving north. Species are moving north. So what does that mean, not only to our ecosystems, but also to the industries that depend on them? People need to eat. How do we address that? How do we take that feedstock and turn it into materials? And Eric's gonna talk about that. Iron and, and minerals of the future. When we need to go somewhere in mine, it obliterates an ecosystem. Yep. But how can we do that so we can restore it? How can we do it so we get higher value? How can we do it so that we can have a uh, national economy? Minnesota's sitting in the center of it. And what you guys are doing, are you helping us drive that innovation to drive impact? Because if we're not having an impact, what are we doing it for? And if that impact isn't a true impact, is it an impact or a detraction? Those are the questions. So the reason uh, this next piece, and I'm just going to introduce something and kind of put it on top of you, is that because we have that, that three ring circus, oops, sorry, thank you. Because of that three ring circus and how they interact with each other, we are now in a position as, a, as an institute, but also as a region, that's all of us, to be able to participate in a national effort to reduce carbon emissions by, re by decarbonizing heavy industry and hard to decarbonize industry. If you look at the carbon effluent that humankind puts in the air, three quarters of it is due to the way we use energy. Splitting out into thirds, industry, buildings, and transportation. You look at steel, that's about 12% of humankind, CO2. Add concrete to that, now you're getting to the 20s. Add, add liquid fuels, now you're talking into the 30s and higher. How can we do that without emitting fossil carbon? Like I said, nobody's buying insurance very easily anymore. How do we get to this? It's a big, big problem. So what we're talking about is this Midwest Industrial Transformation Initiative, MITEI for short. And these are the things I'm headed down the street to talk to the mayor in about uh, half an hour here to, to really pull together this as a statewide effort. It's an IRA funded game changer. It's the one time we have to change our industry here in Minnesota. The last taconite plant was built in 1972 with a 30 year time frame. What are we gonna do? So I'm gonna go fast on this just to kind of introduce the idea if this thing will work. So the Department of Energy was looking for a place to go and demonstrate green technology to reduce carbon emissions from hard to decarbonize industries. For those of you that have ever walked through an iron mine, you see the massive size of a two to three billion dollar investment. Changing that to not emit carbon is not simple, but it has to be done. So looking for green electrons, how to store hydrogen 
This was taking green electrons, splitting water in two to make hydrogen and oxygen, and use hydrogen as the fuel versus uh, carbon-based, uh, uh, petroleum-based fuels. We have to store it, we have to have access to water, iron, et cetera, and we have to have infrastructure. That's what the Department of Energy was looking for. Northern Minnesota is identified as the place to do it, but they're also looking at how to cross sector couple. If we can make green iron, green concrete, e-fuels in the same place, interconnecting those two so they're more efficient, that's what the Department of Energy was wanting to do, and this is the map that's hanging in the DOE headquarters in Washington, D.C. today. They looked around the country and said, where can this happen? Based on the work that that our colleagues here are getting done is we're in a place where we can talk about these things because we understand the ecosystems, we understand the resources, and we understand the industries and, and their impacts and how to work that together. So this is exciting. It's because we framed the research, we framed the conversation, we engage and we try to move forward and now we're in the place where we are looking at three lenses of success. We're really good at this one, technology. Yeah, it, that's what scientists are good at. And we're pretty good at saying, yeah, if I can do this, I can make money and I can have an economy. Where we fall is this one. How do the communities benefit? How do they benefit from whatever we do? And how do the, particularly the, the communities that have been left behind benefit? And this is a big part of the, the IRA law is J40, Justice 40. So 40% of whatever we do has to impact the regional communities. So here's, here's a picture, and this is where we'll kind of stop. Uh, this is what we're trying to build with partners here in the state and the federal government and the state government. And it gives you an idea of what we can do if we reach. Generation of renewable energy and hydrogen that runs a green iron plant here in Minnesota. Demonstrating that we can do that and demonstrating that it can be a national model for how to do this in other parts of the country. If you remember back in the day, the nuclear industry was created by the Department of Energy doing it in one place and spreading it around the country. That's their aim and they're, they're here in Minnesota wanting to try to do it here. NRI is involved because of those three rings that are intersecting and because of the way we've been uh, preparing ourselves, frankly, to think about starting with empathy, uh, asking the right questions, making sure we're talking around that circle, not in sections of it, okay? Eventually, and here's the last picture, is if we can take the hydrogen, run a green iron plant, storage, energy storage, that may be part of it. NRI and NREL are partnering in the background to make sure we're running the experiments as we build a plant. The next step in, by the 2035 is to be aiming for this. We're next to each other. We have the iron and steel next to cement, next to e-fuels. Again, all depending on hydrogen, all depending upon reducing fossil carbon, and all life cycle assessment reviewed, which means if we do something, what are the impacts of that? And that's, that's, that's the full circle of, of, of uh, I, I feel, ethical science, but also using that empathy gene that we're asking the questions, are we making a true difference? Are we making a true impact for good? We've got some major challenges here, and that's what we're here to, here to talk about. So, um, uh, I'm not gonna do this. These are kinda, this is like, <laughs> But anyway, there's mul but, but think about this just for a second. If our job is to have an economy and have a world to live in, they have to work together. And that's the conversation of empathy. It's also the conversation of doing great work. And it's also the conversation of creating the students that we need to hand these things off to because this is a 40-year job. 40-year job. And if we don't do it, we aren't gonna be here. So this is, this is so important and your role in this is so important as we have that, the feedstock, if you will, of thinkers, believers, people that are willing to take a risk and go get something done. So without any further ado, I'm going to run down the street and, and talk to our mayor. Uh, I'm gonna hand it off 
What did I do? Oh, I click. Yeah, thanks. June takes care of everything. Um, <laughs> but uh, I'm going to turn it over to my colleagues who are actually the smart ones in the room. I just get a chance to talk about what they do. Um, but uh, I, I encourage you to listen and look for those threads of empathy. Look for those threads of integration. And get excited a little bit. And we need your students to get excited. Because when we can get people to be excited about jumping into these things and having fun doing it, that's where we got to be. It's, it's not doom and gloom, but we got work to do. So I am honored to introduce Eric Singsoth, who will be honored to introduce his colleagues. Now? Yep. Or at the end? We can, all, we, can all, we can all wait here. OK, very good. So I'm, we're all ready to jump in with an answer. Yep, and I'm going to jump out the window. OK. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. This is on. Excellent. So. Yeah. It's always hard to follow Rolf, but I, I get the pleasure of being the fir first one. But uh, uh, my, myself and my colleagues will, will just give you a brief introduction about uh, what, what we do, what we think about every day, and how we frame questions, how we, the uh, STEM education uh, imp impacts what we do, and how we, how we have put our education to work uh, to, uh, solving some of these, these big issues that Rolf framed. So, uh, I was given the title Molecular Man. <laughs> uh, uh, I, I guess I, I technically work, work with molecules. We all work with molecules of one, one kind or another. Um, uh, my group uh, works on, I, I talked to a few people about this, we work on something called the bioeconomy. How does that relate to this? I mean, how, uh, for the last 150 years, our economy has run on primarily on fossil carbon. That's carbon that we've dug out of the ground, we process it and we make something out of it, and then where does it go at the end? It goes to the atmosphere, or some of it, if it's plastics, go out in that lake or out into the ocean, and they uh, are are there and and don't have any end of life. They're just they're still there. Uh, our my job is to understand how do we make the things that we need every day uh, for our everyday lives, whether it's building materials or goes into steel or it's a polymer, or it's a plastic or a packaging. How do we make those from uh, bio-based or renewable forms of carbon? And that's what we do by manipulating and working with molecules. How did I get into this with my education? My background, I studied photosynthesis. Um, I studied specifically, I was interested in how do plants, these solar-powered things, you know, take carbon molecules and make the molecules that become eventually plants. Uh, and then how do these interact with uh, the, does this work? Uh, how, do, how do these living systems take carbon, take a atmospheric carbon, and turn them into things and stuff that does, that makes a, a forest or an ecosystem work uh, without uh, creating any waste? In fact, they, one of the things they also do is, is take some of that carbon and put it back into the soil for long-term storage. My job is to understand how we apply uh, science and technology and engineering so that we can follow the, we can create an economy based around these same principles where uh, the materials are uh, recycled, they are always, uh, always have an end of life, and we're using renewable carbon to make materials that uh, don't wind up polluting our atmosphere, our lakes, our land, and ourselves. So with that, Leah. I'll talk to you next. Yes, sure. <laughs> yes, uh, thank you, everyone. My name is Leah Schleppenbach, and um, my research at NRRI is more focused on water quality. And like Eric said, those little critters that are in the water that are actually conducting the, uh, the photosynthesis. So today, I'll specifically kind of emphasize the importance of and the significance of cyanobacteria um, harmful algal blooms. Um, so what are cyanobacteria? Some of you may know, some of you may have never heard of it. It's a, another word or more commonly known as blue-green algae. And these blue-green um, algae, let's see, 
there we go. There's a picture of some blue-green algae. Um, I was speaking to some today that have seen it on Lake Vermilion. You may have seen it or may not be familiar with it. Well, these are harmful algal blooms, and they have the ability to sometimes become toxic. And those um, toxins have implications on our health, on um, pet health, on wildlife health. Um, these harmful algal blooms are beginning to increase in frequency and duration. So a lot of the research that we do at NRRI, specifically in the water group, is looking at these harmful algal blooms, why they're occurring, when they're occurring, and what is causing these blooms to become toxic. Uh, a couple of these pictures, this is Barker's Island um, here in, in the region um, off of in Lake, in Lake Superior, in Superior, Wisconsin. And here's another picture from the Apostle Islands, um, just down the South Shore. And we're beginning to see these harmful algal blooms become um, more prevalent across Lake Superior, unfortunately. And that's likely due to um, some of the factors that Ralph was talking about, um, about the climate change that we're beginning, that we're experiencing, warming temperatures, changing um, lake turnovers, changing and, and climate change overall. So at NRRI, researchers are actively developing um, different projects to analyze how these cyanobacterial blooms are um, implicating um, our, our water quality. So we have several projects that are um, current and previous projects that focused on cyanobacteria harmful algal blooms. Um, some of my master's research funded by Minnesota Sea Grant that we collaborated with uh, looked at the different drivers of harmful algal blooms in Minnesota lakes. We also have um, another current project uh, in the estuary here in Duluth looking at the cyanobacteria harmful algal blooms with a goal to develop a, a monitoring program of the estuary. And then some of my more current research with uh, in collaboration with the EPA, we're looking at uh, more of the overall phytoplankton community across the, the Great Lakes and cyanobacteria are a component of that community and analyzing how those communities are changing over time. Um, it's important that NRI is doing this research to be able to provide information and guidance to managers to be able to reduce reduce these blooms from occurring in the future to reduce toxin exposure and um, be able to better inform the public you know when it's important when when it's safe or when it's not safe to be swimming and recreating in these waters I'll hand it to Matt Thank you. Thanks June uh, I'm the crusher why am I the crusher so well it's before I get there to understand how to produce my my goal as part of my research group Matt Milner research group leader for mineral processing and metallurgy is to understand and determine how do we make these material, metal, and mineral products that we need today to just sustain our quality of life, but also fee, you know, fuel the green economy. We know um, the impacts of climate change, and part of that is a high is going to require a high amount of mineral and material resources. So why am I the crusher? Well, some of the challenges in mining, we, we know we have these resources. We have tons of mineral resources available in the state, around the world, both that's been, um, you know, not mined yet, some above ground in stockpiles and, and, you know, byproduct streams, and then some even in your cell phone as, you know, as you go to recycle and look at circularity of these materials. There's a lot of, lot of opportunities, so we say, okay, we've got the material, you know, what, what's the problem? We need these material, you know, we need these minerals. Well, the problem is it takes a massive, massive amount of energy, massive, massive amount of carbon, it impacts our water, impacts our, our land. So how do we balance the need for these mineral uh, material products but also taking care of the economy, the communities, and the, the environment all you know, simultaneously? So just a quick quiz. Does anyone know in Minnesota uh, what, where Minnesota stands in terms of national mining value? Are they first, second, third, fourth, fifth? They're fourth. So Minnesota's fourth. That's pretty high. Most of it primarily due to iron ore. That's great, right? It is absolutely great for, um, for jobs and things like that. But the problem is these are so energy intensive. You know, for, for example, like Rolf said, seven to nine percent of the global CO2 is from the iron ore and steel industry. Now, granted, our US-based um, steel making is much, much more efficient and, and less carbon intensive. But regardless, that's a massive number. So where are those carbon sources? Well, it's natural gas, 
it's fossil coals, things like that. So the research we're doing is how do we displace those fossil fuels with something that's either carbon neutral or even carbon negative? Some of the opportunities that we've been talking about is hydrogen. So with natural gas, there's opportunity to displace the, the natural gas with hydrogen, where instead of a byproduct being CO, uh, carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide, the, the, the emission is water, H2O. That's one opportunity. Another one is taking some of the, the research that Eric's doing of turning materials, biomass, uh, plastics into a carbon source and directly replacing the, the, the coal in steel making today. There's a lot of um, not just carbon emissions, but also things like mercury and sulfur and things like that that can really impact the, the local environment, going back to Rawls comment about the Justice 40. So beyond that, um, what are some of these opportunities? Again, there's, there's various mineral opportunities in the state and, and beyond. It's just looking at the scale of some of these. I mean, the value of, for example, iron is, is it's one of the least valuable materials in the world. So how do you make money doing it? Well, you make many, many tons, not just many tons, thousands of tons, millions of tons. It takes a lot of material, a lot of volume to make money in iron and steel. Well, that's great, but that means big holes in the ground. That means huge energy. I mean, we're, we're uh, in the taconite plants, they, they, they indurate, they fire their pellets at almost 2,500 degrees Fahrenheit, making millions, millions of tons. So these are huge, huge energy, water, and carbon um, consumers and emitters. So we're looking at what are those opportunities in the state, whether it be through hydrogen, whether it be through biocarbons, whether it be completely replacing the steel making technology today and going 100% to electrical, electrical generation, uh, or electrical um, process that'll take the iron ores, convert them into molten metal in one step using 100% electricity, no, no fossil carbons whatsoever. And so what we, again, going back to my, the, the starting point is, what are we aim, aiming to do? We're, we're, we know we're going to need materials, minerals, and metal products in the future. Our goal is to figure out how do we do that in the most sustainable manner possible using the resources we have here in the state and globally. So thank you. All right, um, my name is Annie Bracey and I am the bird bejeweler which is probably the best job you could have. Um, so I work in the avian ecology lab. Um, I work in the um, ecosystem resilience kind of area and forest and lands and water. So we kind of um, work everywhere because birds are found everywhere. And I would argue that maybe they're the best integrator. Um, so we study bird populations in the state um, and Basically, because NRI is an applied research institute, the goal is that all of the research we do has direct um, on-the-ground implications or we are able to give managers um, information uh, that can help them better manage their lands for um, bird populations. So, for example, um, we do experimental cuts for logging, trying to understand what types of cuts, clear cuts, um, different harvest types, can impact wildlife on the ground to try to help um, make better choices going forward in terms of land management. We also help, oh, how about I give you some pictures to look at, there we go. We also help um, inform restoration actions. So we work with partners um, collecting information at sites pre-restoration, um, help with the design, um, what kind of habitats, what kind of plant communities do some of these birds that are in need. Um, required to flourish and be productive. Um, and so, especially for you guys, since you're teachers, we did this for you. Um, in, in light of the theme for um, today, empathy and research, teaching students, you know, everyone likes an acronym, so we came up with SPIRIT for you. Science-based, passionate, innovative, respectful, inclusive, and teamwork. We probably shouldn't have gotten paid the day that we all sat around and came up with that, but it was fun and it was worth it. And I really think that it, it's true. Um, you know, the goal is we base all of what we try to inform people on on science that's really um, solid. We want to use that to have actions, right? So facts, acts, and packs, that's another one for you. You can take these <laughs> home with you. Um, so we want to use the science, right? We don't want it to just sit 
um, and be filed away in a technical report that nobody uses. And one of the issues is when you're trying to, to help people make decisions when there's so much happening and we don't really know the best way to do it, is to be okay with the fact that whatever we do do, it's better than nothing and we're learning and we can go back and revisit. We can take that information um, and that can help inform the next restoration project or the next um, thing that we're working on. And so, um, working at a scale that is meaningful, that's another thing um, that's important. So we can do really localized projects, but the goal is to try to work with other people across the state, across the nation and the world. Um, and again, because birds you know, breed here for six weeks out of the year and then they're migrating to South America and back, we have this really global connection. And so we can do conservation um, on a meaningful scale when we work and collaborate with people uh, around the world. Um, and so I feel like one of the things that um, is meaningful to me is obviously when you are privileged enough to have the choice of a career, um, you're mainly like intrinsically motivated to do your work. So you're already there to do it. And then you have a team that you work with that is similarly, um, you know, inspired to do the work. That makes it even more fun. And then collaborating, um, I feel like it, it's amazing. And getting kids to the point that they feel like they have a space, especially in college, obviously is, is K through 12. And so um, I was happy to come here today. And I saw Erin. I spoke with her class in McGregor this week. And then also I saw Debbie Peterson, who is a high school teacher in Walker. And this is an awesome fact, but she has not only been a teacher, but she has been working for NRI as a bird researcher for 28 years. So obviously, um, it's an incredible place to be. Debbie, you're amazing. And we keep thinking, we're like, God, what year is her last year going to be? And when do we throw the big party? It's not happening. <laughs> Um, so, you know, it's just a good example. Obviously, teachers are motivated to do the work they do, and they do a lot of other stuff on the side, and so um, getting them to the point where they can come and work with us is um, awesome. So, thank you. brilliant thank you so much it means a lot I love birds and I don't hear them speak very often so this was a, even a better treat now I know what they sound like <laughs> it was ro this one was Rolf's idea the cakes might have been my idea but the swan song was Rolf's so <laughs> thank you um, does anyone have questions for our team before we yeah and and we can go back at our stations here we and a few minutes. can Discussions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So do people go off to school and do research? It's not our job, <laughs> but we do have people who make time for it. This episode is brought to you by Traceology, oh. an original podcast from Charles Schwab. So Traceology is a show about the psychology <laughs> and economics. <laughs> this American life. So we have to be really careful with how we spend our time because we're very soft funded, but we do have people who are passionate and can make time for. Oh, and can make time for, <laughs> for doing that, but it's um, something we have to be really careful about. And I have had, like Aaron's class came uh, for a tour. I'm more of the public outreach person at NRI. Um, so you can definitely reach out to me and I try to, when I can, 
bring in scientists to talk with people. Any other questions? Oh, this is your moment to ask the embarrassing question. <laughs> Want me to start? Okay, uh, I will start first. Um, so I have been here for eight years, since 2016. Prior to that, I was a professor in, in that state to our east, in the University of Wisconsin system. Um, and as I said, my background really is in photosynthesis, but I had an opportunity to, um, to work with, the, we work with a lot of the, pulp, the paper industry, pulp and paper mills, uh, and some of the people there, we developed something called a biorefinery process. And um, that's now it's a private company. Uh, and uh, then they uh, recruited me to come here to integrate uh, what was a, like a wood products, forest products group, a chemistry group, and an energy group all into this thing that's called bioeconomy. Um, I would say that I've always been interested in the natural resources field and then um, kind of throughout high school and college I was able to narrow down more that I wanted to be focusing in on biology. Um, so I have my bachelor's in biology and then came to Duluth to do my master's in the water resources um, science program and worked with Chris Philstrip at NRRI and then was very, very fortunate enough to um, get a full-time job after grad school at NRI. Um, two years ago. So I've been in Duluth working at NRI for four years, but full time at, at NRI for two years. Thank you. Um, when did I want to knew, when did I know I want to do something technical? Um, probably goes back to when I was young, young, listening to Phil Collins uh, tapes and, and records with my dad and we would open up the record player and kind of look at what was in there and put it back together and just kind of tinker around. When I, I knew I wanted to be an engineer is actually sophomore year. My, uh, my high school um, math teacher was very, very influential. We just, we just connected and made sense. Math turned from being kind of annoying to almost interesting. <laughs> she, she challenged me to, to treat it as a puzzle. That was the biggest takeaways. Don't treat it as a thing you gotta do. Treat it as, as, as a puzzle that you have to piece together. Mm -hmm. And that kind of changed my mentality and it's kind of stuck with me ever since. Um, I started working at, uh, at NRI as an intern in 2007. Uh, at that time, it was less minerals and more in biomass gasification. So as, a, as an intern, I was actually operating a, a biomass, small biomass gasifier, and it was, it was incredible. Just a great experience. So I went back, finished with uh, my education, and started working full-time. Um, oh, geez. I don't like that. Uh, um, I've been working at NRI for uh, about 15 years, and I started as an undergrad working in a lab and getting some experience. Then I took some time off school and have come back and since have, have still been working at NRI but went back to school to get my master's and then my PhD um, while still working at NRI. So I feel it's been really, really great to get to do that, to still do research and um, get my education um, while being there. So, And I didn't have a strong background in science or math in high school at all. So once I got into college, I had to prove myself. I think you have like, a, you, I don't know, it was like, um, I, wa I had to write a letter to make, make me get into school because I had such bad grades. So that motivated <laughs> me, it did. That motivated me in college because I always just assumed I'd go to college and then I was like, oh, you have to get in too. So then I, <laughs> From that point on, I was I was all about it, and I loved it. I moved around a little bit between subjects, but um, yeah, getting there was what made the difference. <laughs> I think that's an important point to share with your students because there's overwhelmingly a number of students they don't know what they want to do. They're seniors. I ask them when I go out, and I say, "What do you want to do? What do you want to study?" And they're all just kind of shrugging their shoulders. So that's a very valuable piece you shared with us today. Um, thank you. And I like that you got bad grades, too. <laughs> That's even more motivating. <laughs> I got a D in higher algebra, but then I found out it was because my 
teacher was really, really a poor teacher. And that was at my 20-year class reunion. I thought, if only I had known that when I was you know, a senior or junior, it would have made the difference. Not all math teachers are bad, though. I just don't want to give you all a bad rap. He just, he was so boring. It was like reading a dry, dull, icky recipe. And so I hope none of you are like that. <laughs> I like the puzzle analogy for math. Anyone else have any questions for our staff? One thing I want to point out is we actually have a lot of students who come through after high school, um, get jobs as field technicians. Um, our summers are really busy. We'll hire as many as 40 to 60 even, depending on our research activity level. Um, they are the boots on the ground. They learn a lot just by doing and being out and collecting data and understanding where that data is going to go and what it's going to be used for. Um, I have a sheet going around. I, I write the stories about the Institute. If you want to get the newsletter, in yeah. fact, in this one, I'm going to be writing about the bird lab that Annie works in and their fax, ax, packs. Um, yep, yes. <laughs> the spirit, that's a new one. So, yeah. Um, so I hope you'll, you'll sign up for that. Um, if that's the, it, then thank you all for inviting us. I just want to say thank you to Patty oh. because thinking of our research in the, in the framework of empathy has been just like, ooh, wow, this okay. really works. I really, it was really enjoyable putting this together. Well, thank you very much. You guys rocked it in April. You rocked it again today. And thank you for wearing your capes yes. again. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Yeah, she wants a photo, yeah. Well, we grab a photo shoot here. Um, I'm just going to mention that. What, what do we have for time? Okay, let's take that little 10 minute break now, and then we'll switch over into empathy with Ann Harrington. We're very excited to be here. I do a little team with her, with her information, but it's really, really, um, I hope you'll stay. And we have ice cream and very beautiful cookies. They're science themed and they're huge. And so you don't want to miss those, okay? Thank you. See you in 10 minutes. <laughs>